and welcome to Significant TV, Significant Stories, Significant Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Fran McNeil, and joining me in the studio today is Ann Atkins, author and president of Flash History Press. Now, Ann has built a business with books and educating and enlightening her readers of journeys of discovery, strength, and leadership. So, let's welcome Ann Atkins. Ann, how are you today? Thank you, Fran. Oh, it's just a great day. It is a great day, <laughs> and we spend some time out in the sun. Exactly. A little bit earlier yes. talking. <laughs> you have done some very significant things in publishing books, but I know there's a story behind what got you started as an entrepreneur. Can yeah. you take us back to that passion? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my background professionally is I worked as a counselor for years, and so mm -hmm. I would use historical people as examples to my clients as to why they too can overcome things and move on and just be emboldened to make those tough decisions. Um, and so I would use examples like from Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> and yet out there what's usually the books about these people, wonderful biographies, but they're more the academic slant. And so I realized, well, I just need to write some books to tell these stories. So I wrote three, one on Eleanor Roosevelt, one on Golda Meir, and the third one is on Marie Curie, Madame Curie. And, and they're user-friendly, so now instead of just reaching 20 or 30 people a week, uh, as a counselor, I can literally reach hundreds with these stories that very much are encouraging to them. So that's the basis of why I even started writing and then making it as a business was just the smart thing to do. <laughs> that makes total sense and dollars. Uh, right. You not exactly. only write, you speak, um, you collaborate with other people. Let's talk though about this this whole business of being a social worker. What were some elements when you were doing that that are transferable to the subject matter that you chose. I mean, you are writing about really strong women, and right. often social workers, to my knowledge, work with people that may not be feeling so strong, may not exactly. be feeling so confident. And, and yet for every one of these, say the three women that I've written about, there's stories there of times where they suffered with betrayal, they suffered with anorexia, there was times for all three of them that they were suicidal and that just speaks to any anyone we uh so many people on their journey they've all gone through these things so it doesn't matter that oh you know you and i are not going to be first lady of the united states probably right no but although i've always thought about <laughs> world domination uh you know <laughs> people have had we'll, to pull we'll, me back from that we'll work together on <laughs> world peace but but so when i when they hear these stories of these three other people because i write them in a very storytelling fashion it's not with the ideal of oh this is how you become a prime minister no no this is though the story of when Golda went through what Marie went through and this is how they chose they just rawly chose to overcome something ah, that speaks to everybody and especially if you're going through low times then you really want that I had a, uh, an email once from a woman that came to hear me speak she said you know, and in the morning when I woke up, I didn't even feel like, one, getting out of bed, let alone coming to hear somebody talk. But my friend came, picked me up, dragged me. And she said, you know, after that, after hearing you, but it wasn't me, it was hearing the stories. And this time I was talking about Eleanor Roosevelt. She says in her email, in the morning I had some big decisions to make and I was so scared. But after hearing about Eleanor, I still had the decisions to make and I was still scared, but I knew I could do it. There, that's the point. That is the that's point. The point. Mm -hmm. So let's role play for a moment. And I know that officially now you're not a social worker, and in your audience there are people yeah. that are facing tough decisions, maybe at a low point of their life, maybe experiencing a major life change. So I'm in the audience, I'm the mother of two, I'm thinking about putting one of my children in a special needs school and I have one child that is feeling a little frustrated because they're not doing well with their music lessons. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to a talk where you're talking about Golda Meir mm -hmm. and I'm not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So what 
story might you might I hear you sharing in the audience? Um, Golda comes from a background of just a very nondescript Jewish immigrant family. So it's not like, oh, she had a lot of money up her sleeve or a family name that <coughs> would help her with decisions. And she loved being a mother. She had two children herself. And so she writes about, again, it's, it's those torn decisions, maybe not the exact same scenario as somebody in my audience right now, but to just hear about, say, Golda right now, we're talking about her, to hear she was a mother too, and she made no bones about it, of then the terror in her of how to make these decisions of what's best for her children, of where to send them to school. Oh, she, one of her daughters, her daughter, she only had one, uh, was very, very ill, and she knew she had to get her back to New York City even for uh, special hospital treatment. And the doctors at the time, it wasn't Israel yet, they were saying, oh no, don't, the, the, the triple killer. And Golda just knew in her heart no, I take that trip, and it's a darn good thing she did because then at the hospital she, in New York, she was re-diagnosed and the child was well within six weeks. But the point is that any of us, mother or father, what we can know is you know in your heart. Just dare to follow what's in your heart. Yep, it's not the same scenario, but the answer is in your heart. In and, your heart. And, and that's, Golda did that, Eleanor did that, Marie did that. They all had to do that with their children. So you have children as well. Mm -hmm. You were building your business, running a family, your own empire, and how did you balance writing and thinking about building out your business and interacting, developing a publishing company? I mean, how did you do that? Well, you get up at 4.30. <laughs> oh, okay, it's a beat the clock thing. And it is a matter of time management and everything. Um, people ask me, oh, did you watch this movie or did you go do this? And I was like, no, no, I didn't. You know, there's a lot of things that I say no to. Um, at the time, uh, my husband was um, very, very supportive. And so, I, you know, he certainly wasn't expecting me to be in the kitchen and have a special dinner on the table at 6 o'clock or something. So I had a lot of family support. My kids were very proud that I would take these steps and it was also then too a way of showing them to keep my own identity. My identity is not wrapped up in my children, which as a counselor, I would always advise, especially uh, you know moms, you need to make sure you keep your own identity. Well, now it was time for me to <laughs> live and practice what I preach because they were all gonna be going into college and starting their life, and trust me, they were not interested in me you know, being right there for them all the time, and that was a good thing. So. Um, just all those factors came into play, but it was very much I had support from, from my family to do that too. Speaking of support, you talked a little bit about Golda Meir's story. There are quotes that I always hear about Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, being the first lady has got to be challenging. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm a little bit older, I can actually identify a lot with Michelle Obama. But what, take us to Eleanor Roosevelt. What was her strength? Where did she, and what was the story behind her strength? Eleanor uh, was very much born in today's world, we would call her an enabler. She wrote the book on enabling um, and just being there for everybody and being the support person and never thinking of herself, which was very much the role model back then. Uh, you didn't have people like Oprah saying, go girl, <laughs> you know, it's just, it just wasn't gonna happen. And so when things really disintegrated for Eleanor, uh, when she was in her 30s, 1918, uh, is when she finds out about the big affair between, uh, from her husband and everything. And she just has, this is an incredible defining moment where she just answers the question for herself, who am I? And so that's when she goes into the quote so many of us know, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And the beauty of that quote is not just, oh, well, she's a first lady, and of course she can say something like that. I mean, if you and I were first lady, we could say smart things like that too, right? Because you're already so powerful. No, she earned that quote. She, this was not rhetoric for her. She lived by it, and she had lived into that quote, so now, she had like this right and the moral authority to, to live it, which then is what we go by to. Yeah, so like that, she could say, she had a quote to um, do one thing every day that scares you. 
And what was beautiful about that is I had somebody come up to me after a talk one time, and they told me their mother uh, in the 1940s had been a teacher in Detroit, and at that time women were not allowed to be in the union, in the teachers' union, just men. I know, can you believe that? So the women, and yet this mother, had always been telling the daughter, oh, did you read Eleanor's uh, My Day column today? Um, Eleanor would have been all over social media. She would have had a Facebook page. She would have had a blog. She would have been on Twitter. Eleanor did social media. So anyway, this mother was always telling the daughter, did you read the column today? What's her quote and everything? So here they are. The, D the Detroit teacher women have decided to make their own union. They go to this mother and say, we'd like you to be president of it. And this woman was like, Rrr! you know, because she, she didn't see herself that way. She, and yet she knew, how can I go home and tell my daughter, read Eleanor's quotes, do one thing every day that scares you, if I don't do it myself? So that's, and, and so this mother, of course, took the job as the president of this first teachers union in Detroit. I've got this woman now telling me this with tears running down her face. That was her mom and the courage and the, the strength that it gave her because Eleanor then would always make these ideals a reality. And I've heard, oh, if I've heard one story, I've heard a hundred stories because I've been giving Eleanor talks for mm, eight years. And these women, particularly, or men, they come up to me with these stories that she would do this for them. Well, Anne, I hear the passion, clearly. You have built a team around this process of creating mm -hmm. a book. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and why that's so important to you as an author. Yeah, it's because uh, even as an author, it's not a one-man show. You have uh, just whether that's family and friends and everything, I have people that have graciously been what I call my group of readers, that when I've finished a manuscript, they read my work, they give me feedback, they know they can be brutally honest. All of that's hugely important because of trying to stay on a budget, then you have a chance to go in and rework things before I send it to an editor, who is also amazing. But I don't have to pay her as many hours because the work in, is so already polished. So I have my team of readers for me. These same people then review book covers for me and give me their feed book, kind of like a focus group. Uh, my editor, who is just fabulous. Um, the woman that designs my book covers and did my bookmarks that I use as a business card. All of these people. But they, they all believe in what I'm doing, and that's the real beauty of it. These aren't just people I'm paying or something. It's like, no, they, it's like, oh, good. You know, they this like being a team. part of the project. Yeah, this is your yeah team. so it really pr gives it a lot of energy and love. Yeah. And speaking of energy and love, we are almost out of time. In 15 or 20 seconds or so, what's a lesson that you'd like to share with entrepreneurs that are listening? <clears throat> Even if you're not able to go into something full-fledged, full-time, just start finding a way to take it one step at a time. Just just a little thing. Even when I started writing, um, I just put my notes down on three by five cards and just kept tossing them in a box because, oh, I've got to go pick somebody up at three o'clock. Um, and, and so it gave me a satisfaction. So I would say to anybody that say just starting a business, just just keep chipping away at it. And, and it, hopefully it's something you love and you won't give up and you won't stop. Thank you, Anne. We've had a chance to be in the audience and for you in your home or in your car or watching on your Google Watch um, to hear Anne Atkins, author of Flash History Press. She writes stories about women leaders, women who have shown us what it really means to be out and about and active. I'm Fran McNeil, host of Significant TV, and you're watching Significant TV, significant stories with significant entrepreneurs like Ann Atkins.